Our stories and passages today hint at the kind of king Jesus was to be. We've seen prophecies, we've heard angels' song, Zachariah's song, John the Baptist's song, Anna's song, all of these songs pushing us forward to this advent, to this time, to this season of Christmas. But we get our strongest hint as to what kind of Messiah and what kind of king we're dealing with as we read on in Matthew chapter 2. The first thing we note is there are those who are visiting Magi. You know probably about as much about them as I do. Middle Eastern, probably Zoroastrian, which means that they believed in Angra Mainyu and Angra, I forget the other one, uh, God of good and God of evil. They were uh, definitely dualists. Uh, They came from cultures that took uh, what we would call astrology very seriously. Uh, They came from cultures that took astronomy very seriously. They looked for signs and portents in the heavens, something we're not tuned into at all, primarily because of the smog and because we have all kinds of other devices to help us navigate in the world. But there was a time when people found their way around the planet by the stars, where they navigated seasons by the signs of the heavens. They could tell what was coming by the changes that they saw in the skies. We're lucky if we can identify Orion and the Big Dipper. Am I right? A few of us can pick out the North Star, and many of us would get that wrong because it's probably Pluto or something, uh, Neptune, who knows. You can tell I'm not an astronomer, and I don't say that with pride. I say that with shame. Whoever these characters were, they were princely, they were educated, and they were spiritual. They were serious about their faith. And when they saw the portent in the heaven, when they read the signs, interesting, isn't it? When they read the signs, they knew not only what it meant, but where to go. And they followed this moving star in the heavens. Oh, you'll read entire books on whether the star was an angel or whether it was they can trace a certain time of year in which there was an astrological phenomena, a comet or something. That doesn't matter to me for today's purposes. What matters to me is that these men, and presumably others, saw this phenomena in the heavens and understood it to be something unique and a portent of something very, very great. And they acted on that. They assembled gifts fit for a king, and they put it all together in a caravan. That would have to include enough things to pay taxes, to buy off uh, roving bands of marauders, to uh, feed and house and take care of their entourage, their servants as they went. And of course, they enter as a group of somebodies as they go to see Herod. They visit the reigning monarch and they explain their purpose, having come from afar. And we hear something in the text that we've never heard in any of the prophecies or any of the angel visits or anything up to this point. We are here to see him who is born King of the Jews. That's new. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Joseph and Mary both being of royal descent of the line of David. Here would be one born of royal blood, the King of the Jews. No other writer has identified it thus. No other prophecy has identified it thus. The Magi show up with this prophecy. We have seen his star and have followed it and have come to worship him who is born King of the Jews. That title would be used 
again into the future on a very unhappy Friday. That title would be scrawled on a piece of parchment and nailed to the cross above the thorn-crowned head of our Messiah King. Here is he who is King of the Jews. No longer a title born of seeking and honor. No longer a title born of recognition and respect. No longer prophetic. It stands as a mockery. And as the judgment of an empire that failed once to kill him, but wouldn't fail twice. Here is he who is the king of the Jews. The Magi foretell it. The Magi see it. The Magi know it even as they prepare for their journey. And when they get there, they're joyously surprised when the star indeed stops in the place where they are to be. And they are able to find the child. And we note that they bring with them several things of value, great value in the day, some of them still valuable today. Gold remains valuable, ever more so. It is estimated that there is only been the amount of gold discovered and present in the world now is only equivalent to what would fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Now, that is not a lot of gold, if you think about that, distributed throughout the planet. Now, I don't have a source for that quote, and that could be very wrong, but it, it was meant at least, at the very least, it illustrates us how rare the substance actually is. It takes a lot to fill an Olympic swimming pool. Let's just put it that way. Gold is indeed rare and precious, and they bring him gifts befitting a king. Gold. Frankincense and myrrh, precious spices, used to anoint the body of the living as well as the dead. And foretelling of a time in the future when women would gather around the body and anoint it with frankincense and myrrh and place it lovingly for burial. This is the kind of king who was coming. One who wouldn't take over a Roman Empire. One who would die having been a shepherd to his people, Israel. Interwoven into our story is all kinds of intrigue. Herod, half-Jewish, reigning tetrarch, calls the, the, the Magi in for a secret conference. He wants them to collude with him unknowingly in a plot to make sure that any would-be king is well taken care of, properly received. Tell me where I might find him that I might go and worship him, he says, and the Magi describe where the star would be taking them and the process. And he says, and when you found this child, come and tell me that I may go. They get to the child, they offer their gifts, but they are warned. They realize something is not right and take a different route home, bypassing Herod altogether. By the time Herod becomes wise to this, time has gone by. And he knows that he has only a two-year window to deal with. Now, whether the uh, Holocaust in Ramah is, is uh, exaggerated or whether it's a uh, literary device or historical is another thing that some scholars have debated. But for purposes of today's discussion, we know that the writer of the Gospel of Matthew sees direct fulfillment to an Old Testament prophecy. And we read it just a few minutes ago. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. The context 
is of Israel no longer being, being prophesied against and no longer being able to be in their country. And the promise of restoration is made in the same passage. But Matthew takes this and appropriates, appropriates it. I can't speak. It's a new year, right? Hope this isn't a portent of things to come. Appropriates this passage as he looks at this story. Ramah is weeping because their children are no more. The slaughter of the infants has taken place. Adding to the intrigue, we have another angel appearance, this time not in the heavens, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men on whom his favor rests. This time not uh, anticipated by John singing holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and power and glory and wisdom and strength and honor and praise. No, this is different. This angel is not promising something great and miraculous like the birth of a Savior. This angel is not warning Joseph that indeed the child that his betrothed carries is of the Holy Spirit. This time our angel says, get up and go to Egypt land and stay there until you hear that it is safe to come back. How interesting that Jesus' earliest childhood is spent in a land that his forefathers were slaves in. How interesting that the one who would deliver us from the slavery of sin spends time in the land in which the great deliverance of the Lord God of the people of Israel took place. And there's our other prophecy, mentioned in one sentence coming this time from Hosea. Out of Egypt I called my son. But listen to the tenderness. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. It was I, verse 3, who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph. I led them with cords of human kindness and with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek and I bent down to feed them. This is God speaking of his tremendous love, his parental care, his tenderness toward this child, toward Israel, the one he has made promises to, to Ephraim and Manasseh, the one he led out of Egypt land. And this prophecy is also appropriated in our Matthew text. Out of Egypt I led my son, Jesus goes to Egypt to be delivered from death. I hope the irony isn't lost on us this morning. The richness of Scripture as it captures this for us. It is in this place that slavery occurs that we also find deliverance for life. Because when Jacob and his descendants went there, when his, Jacob and his children went there in the first place, they were destined to starve. They were seeking a land where there was actually food, where they might live and be delivered from the death that was upon them. And now Jesus lives in the land, delivered from the death that would be upon him. And as I've already said, but we'll reiterate because it's worth remembering, Deliverance from the slavery in Egypt becomes a spiritualized in the deliverance from the Egypt of slavery to sin as we look at the salvation that comes to us in Christ. We have here prophesied a different kind of king, a different kind of savior, one not of this world, but one who would show us the way of the Father, who would lead us gently, 
as a shepherd leads a flock? Who would show us the Father and who would give himself a ransom for many? Here prophesied is the different kind of king. I hope that as we enter this new year and we're able to think about the love of a God who would speak thus, who would prophesy thus, who would use so many different kinds of people to tell a story and make a point, who would bring us to a deeper understanding of his longings and his love and his grace. I hope this kind of king is compelling for us this morning. I would hope that this kind of king would invoke in us the kind of reverence and worship that it did those early kings, those early magi, those shepherds and those wise men. I hope that we too, like Simeon and Anna, might see our salvation in the newborn babe. but in the newborn babe grown in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, grown into the kind of man who would be called rabbi, son of man, son of God, Messiah, Emmanuel, king of the Jews, and most importantly, Lord of all. It's time now for us to break, to do this ordinance of humility which Christ himself performs for the disciples in the upper room, also teaching us what kind of king he was. And so as we practice this, we have three places a family room, as always, which I believe we have this on projection, maybe not. Family room is the fireside room, as I have it. Multipurpose room, okay. And then H and I are where the men and women will gather, and those are the two classrooms to my right, your left, bordering the multipurpose room. Let's break at this time, and then we'll come back to our communion table. May God bless you.